Good morning, church. Uh, well, I'm glad everybody made it inside. Uh, my name is Adam, and I'm the youth and young adult pastor here at First Baptist Surfside. Uh, we're so glad that you decided to worship with us this morning. Uh, if you do happen to be a guest with us this morning, we would love it if you would fill out one of these Connect cards. There should be one uh, in the seat back in front of you. You can drop that off in the offering plate when it goes by. Uh, we would love just to have a record of your visit and get to know you and answer any questions that you might have uh, about our church. We have a few announcements this morning. Uh, first, the student ministry will meet at 5 o'clock tonight instead of 5.30, uh, and that'll be a continual thing. So every week on Sunday nights, our student ministry will now meet at 5. Uh, we'll have supper available from 5 to 5.30, and then we'll have it cleaned up by 5.30 so we can start on time uh, without any extra distractions. Our deacon ordination will be Wednesday, uh, September 21st at 6 p.m., uh, so I hope you make plans to come to that. That's going to be a really sweet uh, service for uh, ordaining our new deacons. Uh, the New York City mission trip will be December 1st through the 4th. That's a Thursday through Sunday, and we'll be sending a team that's going to be led by Pastor Nathan to New York City. We're going to partner with different uh, church planners up in that area and participating in an outreach program called Coats for the City. Uh, if you're interested in that, there will be an interest meeting on September 25th, September 25th, and the deadline to sign up will be October 2nd. Our fall festival will be October 28th. That's our annual trunk retreat fall festival, uh, Friday, October 28th, uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. And we need lots of candy. We need some prizes that we can give away, and we need lots of volunteers. So there's a volunteer card that's attached to your bulletin. And if you want to serve uh, in that way, please fill that out, and you can drop that off in the offering plate when it goes by as well. Um, we also want to extend our sympathies to the family of Miss Mary Nash. Uh, Miss Nash was called home to be with Jesus this past Thursday, and so we're going to have a funeral to celebrate her life today uh, at 2 o'clock this afternoon. So if you'd like to be there, that'll be today here in the sanctuary at 2 p.m. Our scripture that I'm going to read this morning is from Isaiah 43, and it says this, But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, and peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, who I formed and made. Bring out the people who are blind, yet have eyes. Who are deaf, yet have ears. All the nations gather together and peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right. Let them hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Let me pray. So, Father, we bow before you this morning and we come to you only through your son, Jesus. And as we examine what it means to engage the nations with the life-changing power of the gospel, we can have peace and confidence knowing that you have redeemed us, that you've called us by name, that you will be with us as we obey the commission to go. And King Jesus, you laid down your life as a ransom for people from every nation, from every tribe, from every language and people group. And you have commanded your church to bring your sons from afar and your daughters from the ends of the earth, who are also called by your name, and who you created for your glory. 
So Holy Spirit, you are the one who comes alongside us to equip us and help us to obey such an impossible task. We cannot make disciples of all nations on our own, but with you, Lord, all things are possible. And with your help, we can be your witnesses. So help us, Lord, to say yes to whatever it is that you ask of us. And like Isaiah, say, here I am, send me. So all this we ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Y'all would stand with us as we continue in our time of worship here. Well, good morning, church family. Can't help but notice that you look a little wet this morning coming in, but I'm reminded, I know that for many of you, it was inconvenient coming in today. You had to go through a lot of rain, but I just want to remind you, it's worth it. It's worth it to be here today, and it's also a reminder to me, I know during the first service, maybe it'll be like this in the second service, I could barely hear myself think for most of the service, but it was a reminder that the God that we worship is sovereign over even the wind and the rain, the waves, all of nature. He is sovereign over it. And that is the great God that we worship here this morning. Amen. Amen. When you think about prayer, there's a lot of people that come to mind. One pastor that comes to my mind was from the 20th century, the early 20th century, E.M. Bounds. And he says this about prayer. He says, the story of every great Christian achievement is the history of answered prayer. I'm reminded of how important prayer is, both for us individually, but also as a church. We've been talking a lot about the mission of our church, but I'm reminded that even the best laid plans, if it's not for God working in them, they're all a waste. And so today we have two ladies, very special ladies. In fact, I think when you think of First Baptist Surfside in prayer, these are the two ladies that first come to many of our minds. We have Miss Dot Bessinger and Miss Georgette Jones. I'm going to get that right now. Um, But we're so excited to have you guys. And um, these ladies have been over our prayer ministry. And this is just an encouragement for us to pray more as individually. Uh, as individuals, but also for some, there were, we were asking you to consider being a part of our prayer ministry. So first, I'm going to ask Georgette, tell us just briefly, what does our prayer ministry do currently? What are the things that it does? Right now, the prayer ministry does three things. Like many of you, we pay special attention to what the prayer requests are and the prayer needs are within the church body. 
and we set aside special time each day to pray for those prayer requests. We pray in our homes and we meet together over Dot's kitchen table and pray there. The uh, second thing is that um, an email devotion is sent out. So if you're on the church list, you'll get an email with a special devotion in it. The third thing is that we schedule volunteers for our prayer room. And the prayer room, if you haven't noticed, is in the lobby in that corner. And that's the place where you can pray during the worship service. That's a blessing for me when I came here to know that during every one of our services, there's at least one person in that prayer room, even right now, praying for what is happening in this room. And so know that this is bathed in prayer. Miss Dot, I know I was talking to you before service, and you told me that you were part of starting the prayer ministry almost 20 years ago. You said around 2004. Um, go ahead. That's right. I, I joined the church in February of 2004. And Pastor David, every Sunday morning, he'd say, well, I just wish we had a prayer ministry. <laughs> well, the Lord laid it on my heart. We started the prayer ministry sometime, probably 2004 <laughs> or 2005, might have been 2006, but I can still hear him. And the Lord laid it on my heart, and so our ministry, and God has blessed the prayer ministry in this church immensely. And um, why do we have prayer? Can I go on and tell them that? Go for it. <laughs> oh, why do we have prayer? Well, we have prayer answered prayer because it shows us of God's great mercy and his great love that he has for us. And so we've had many, many answers to prayer. In fact, walking down this aisle a few minutes ago, a friend shared with me the answer to prayer for his sister-in-law. So God knows he's the one He gives us great mercy and great love. That's why we pray. Amen. As I think about 20 years of a prayer ministry, I can't help but think that that's not directly connected with just the endurance of this church and how God has worked in this church. So a question for both of you, last question is, give me a, a, just a brief example of how you have seen God answer prayer, maybe either in the church or in your life. Georgette, do you have an example? Uh, yes, I do. Um, We've learned in the prayer ministry that sometimes one of the most effective prayers is just to pray God's word back to him. In Psalm 68, verse 5 and 6, it says that God is a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows and that he puts the lonely into families. So I had was praying through that a little bit over two years ago when I was unexpectedly widowed and learned what it meant to be defended by God mm. with the help and the encouragement from many of you in this church. And then as time passed, I experienced the uh, truth of the next part that he puts the lonely into families mm. when he brought me a new companion and husband. <laughs> so uh, he answered that prayer quite well. <laughs> amen. Amen. Thank you, Georgette. Miss Dot, can you share an example of your life of you, when you've seen God answer prayer? Sure, I'd, I'd love to. In 2016, <clears throat> excuse me, a young couple moved to this to Surfside. They had one child, they had one child, and uh, Pastor David was the pastor at that time, and a pastor friend from his 96 South Carolina, if you know where that is, called and asked him to go and visit this gentleman that was in Grand Strand Hospital. He was very sick. He had pneumonia. His blood sugar was elevated. And he, excuse me, he needed open heart surgery. So we began to pray for this gentleman. And you know, I'm sure Pastor David told us this man's name, but I don't remember his name until later. I'll tell you about that. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But anyway, every time they set up for him to have open heart surgery, 
Pastor David went up there a couple of times a week. He'd always give us a report on how he was doing, how this gentleman was doing. And uh, he would get sick and he couldn't have surgery. So the next week, Pastor David goes up and he comes back. Well, they had him all ready for surgery again, but they couldn't do it. He got sick again. And I thought in my heart, well, man, Lord, the man's going to die before he ever has this open heart <laughs> surgery. <laughs> but anyway, because of some um, health issues of my own, I was in rehab at Tideland's Hospital, and uh, we still praying for this young man. And uh, we were there, and this young man comes in, and just smiling and laughing, good personality, so happy and we were discussing among some of the uh, clients there as we were doing our therapy, what brought us to have to have therapy. And so I shared mine, and the other girl shared, shared hers. Well, this young man began to share his need of therapy. And he started off, he said, well, I was in Grand Strand Hospital, and I, had, uh, I needed open heart surgery. And my ears perked up a little bit. <laughs> and uh, then he said, um, but I finally got it. They scheduled me for surgery. I think it was the third time. <laughs> and, uh, but he did go on and have his surgery. And uh, now he was, he was better and he was there for therapy. And when he finished, I said, oh, my goodness, you're the man our church has been praying <laughs> for all these months and weeks. And he says, my name is Jeff Sargent. Hmm. Now, I know you know Jeff Sargent. Yeah. He showed you these beautiful pictures he paints. Hmm. But I'll never forget Jeff Sargent, and yeah. I'll never forget what God did to me. He showered me with love, and he showed me that the reason we have answered prayer is so God can show us his great mercy hmm. and his great love for us. If you ha Oh, and I forgot, walking down the aisle this morning, that happened on 2017. And I'm walking down the aisle this morning, a friend of mine told me that he's praising the Lord today. His sister-in-law had brain surgery and she was home within a month. So we praise the Lord today. Amen. We praise him for his mercy. We praise him for his love for us. And we praise him, thanking him for all he does for us in Jesus' Amen. name. Ladies, thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. If you'd like to be more involved with our prayer ministry, come up afterwards and talk to them. I think we might have a sign-up sheet in the lobby as well, but we'd love to have you as part of that very special ministry. And speaking of prayer, our deacon Simon Phillips is going to come, and he's going to pray for our offering, and then church, let's give, and let's give joyfully and generously. Simon. Hello, church family. <clears throat> Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, you are the giver of all things good. Everything that we cherish here on earth, Lord, comes from you. And Lord, it's my prayer that these tithes and offerings, Lord, will be acceptable to you. They will be pleasing to you. And, and, and it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Lord, I find you in the seeking. Lord, I find you in the doubt. And to know you is to love you and to know so little else. 
Recently, we moved the Lord's Supper to this part of the service rather than the end of the service for a variety of reasons. Number one, we thought it would be well for us to use the Lord's Supper to help prepare our hearts for the teaching of God's Word. And secondly, we found that we have many children that are going to children's church, many of which should be participating in the Lord's Supper with us. And so we wanted our children to participate as part of our church family because for some, they are already believers and they need to participate. For others, we believe it is a good teaching moment because we would encourage the parents, if you have a child that is not a believer, to not allow them to take the Lord's Supper, but use this as an opportunity to teach them what it means to take the Lord's Supper and what the gospel is. Now, before we take the Lord's Supper together, we need to remind ourselves what it is and what it isn't. We need to remind ourselves this is not part of our salvation. This is not us applying God's grace to us. That This is not us uh, preparing for salvation, completing our salvation in any way. No, this is a symbol of what is Christ has already done in our hearts as believers. As we take the, the bread and the juice, just a moment, you'll find that in front of you. It is just simple uh, wafer and grape juice. There's nothing super spiritual in what I am holding, but what it represents means everything. It's a time of examining our hearts. First Corinthians 11 says, let a person examine himself and then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And even says, this is why many of you are weak and ill and even some have died. So you see, this is a time for us to examine our hearts. God, bring to my mind any unconfessed sin that I might be quick to repent from that so there would be nothing hindering our worship today. And also, to me, this is a time of unification. It is us coming together as one body. I somewhat view the Lord's Supper as our family meal together as we gather as brothers and sisters in Christ united on the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, What we'll do is we're going to introduce one element at a time. We are going to pray over that element. We're going to have a time of music just for us to reflect on what God is doing and what He has done in that moment. And so we're going to begin with the bread, and we're going to remember the body of Christ that was broken on our behalf. And for that, we're going to ask our deacon John Toll to come and pray for the bread. John. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we marvel at your majesty we marvel at your great plans for humanity lord you are a great god we praise you for your your power and and your knowledge lord we just thank you that you give us daily bread for our sustenance here on earth and that you've provided eternal bread through your son jesus christ who died on a cross and held the chastisement of our sins We thank you and we ask that you bless this time together and help us to reflect on your redemption for our souls. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, it says, The Lord Jesus, on the night when He was betrayed, took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is My body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. And then we take the cup, which represents the blood of Christ that was shed on our behalf as He paid the wrath of God. And as he died, that we might live. Today, our pastor Adam is going to come and pray for the cup, and then we will take it together. Adam. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we'll never know how much it costs to see you there upon that cross. And so, Lord, we know that you came to bring grace and truth to those who were in darkness And uh, Father, we know that you shed your blood so that we could have forgiveness of sins and that we could be made clean. Uh, Lord, our sins were like scarlet, but you washed them whiter than snow with your blood. And so God, help us to um, reflect in this moment on what it costs for you to redeem us and to buy us back from the domain of darkness and to bring us into your light. Father, I pray that You would fill us with your spirit, and God, that as we reflect, that we would prepare our hearts for the preaching of your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse 25, it says, In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. With this time, we're going to dismiss our children for Children's Church. And we're going to take our Bibles as we wrap up our series on the mission of First Baptist Surfside, and we're going to turn to Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. Ms. Chris Welk is going to come and read our passage, but again, Romans chapter 10, 1 through 15. Today's scripture reading is Romans 10, 1 through 15. Brothers, My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, 
that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For the, with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him who they have not believed? And how then are they to believe in him who they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This is God's word. Thank you, Chris. I've always loved the parable. I'm not sure who wrote it originally, but it's about a dangerous sea coast where there was often shipwrecks and people were needed to be saved. And so along this seashore, there was a crude, small little medical station. It wasn't much. It was just a hut. And of that hut, there was three or four individuals. They had one small boat and they would watch this seashore day and night for shipwrecks. And when they would happen, they would go into action and they would go to rescue those that had wrecked. Well, over time, people began to hear about this small little rescue station, and they became famous. They had more people come wanting to help. They had people donate to help with that outreach and that service to the community, and so they grew. The medical station began to expand, and some of the newer members started to look around and say, well, this isn't very much. We need to upgrade these facilities so that we can have more people come when they wreck, and when they do come, they can be more comfortable, so they took the emergency beds out and they put nice more comfortable beds they renovated the meeting space to where over time many of those members started saying we kind of like this place we want to spend more time in this place they grew more and more comfortable to the point where they started to think well i don't know if i like going out in the rain so much I don't know if I like risking my life to save others, so they used some of the money to begin hire other people that they would go out as the rescue teams in order to save those that were nearly drowning. Enjoying those comforts, they began to have less and less time and less and less desire to go and rescue anyone. About that time, there was a large ship that wrecked off the coast. The hired crews, they went out and they rescued many and they began to bring them back to the facilities. But what they found was boatloads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. And they were dirty, sick. Some had skin colors that were different. Some spoke different languages. And this new medical station was messed up in the process. They tracked mud in on the carpet. They messed up the new paint. They messed up the facilities. So the property committee got together and decided that they would install showers on the outside of the building so that those that were being rescued could clean up before coming in to receive their treatment. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members were wanting to vote to stop the club's life-saving activities entirely, saying that it was an inconvenience for them and their club there at the rescue station. But there were a few members that insisted that life-saving, that was the very reason they existed in the first place. And in fact, on the door, it said life-saving station. And so they voted and voted down the life-saving activities as long as they said they could continue saving some lives as long as it did not inconvenience them or the facilities themselves. And the story goes today, if you visit along that seacoast, you'll see a number of exclusive clubs. There are still shipwrecks that happen often, and yet now most of the people drown in the process. Church, I am reminded that many churches today have lost sight of the very reason why we exist in the first place. That's one of the many reasons we wanted to develop our new mission statement, that we might be anchored in what the Word of God says is our mission. We weren't trying to come up with something flashy or something new. We were simply trying to articulate the mission of God already found in the Word of God. 
I wonder by now, have you gotten the mission statement? Again, I told you a quiz is coming soon. Do you know the mission statement yet? You'll see it up on the screen on the next slide. What is the mission of First Baptist Surfside? Is we exist to glorify God. Simply, that's why we're here. That's why you're here. But we see in Scripture three main ways that we accomplish that. We exalt Jesus in worship, we equip Christ followers, and we engage the nations with the gospel. And what I hope you start to see is that implied in those statements is a process. One leads to another. Someone gives their life to Christ, their life is transformed. Naturally, they begin to exalt Jesus in their individual lives and also corporately as part of the body of Christ. But being part of the body of Christ leads them to being equipped, that is, growing to be made more like Jesus, both as individuals and they begin to help others look more like Jesus also, which leads to them engaging the nations with the gospel. I'm reminded that discipleship and evangelism, those are not two separate things. Those are not two separate ministries. No, they are two sides of the very same coin. You see, if we are truly following Jesus as disciples, we will naturally begin to look more like Jesus. We will begin to speak more like He spoke, walk more like He walked, and we will love the things that He loved. What was the heart of Christ? To redeem the world through the gospel. So you see, lack of evangelism is really incomplete discipleship. Our mission defines what we are to be about. And if you notice, our mission even defines what does it mean to be a member of our church? What does it mean to be a member of First Baptist Surfside? Because our goal is instead of you being involved in a thousand things, our goal is for you to be involved in three things. What are they? Exalt Jesus in worship, be in a worship service. Number two, equip Christ followers, be an active member of a small group. And third, engage the nations with the gospel, serve using your gifts and talents. So what does it mean to be a member of our church? Worship, discipleship, serve. Simple. That's what we are about. So today as we wrap this series up on the mission of our church, let's spend time on this third statement, engage the nations with the gospel. You've seen it already in Romans chapter 10. There Paul lays out, I think, three truths that we're going to focus on today. The mission of God, the message of God, and the method of God. Number one, the mission of God. Verse one, Paul says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, speaking of Israel, is that they may be saved. Now, we might ask the question, who is the greatest missionary that has ever lived? Some might answer that with someone like Jim Elliott or Lottie Moon or someone even like the Apostle Paul. But what you see in Scripture is that the greatest missionary that has ever lived is God Himself. From Genesis to Revelation, we see one unified story. We call it the grand narrative of Scripture. One story about a God whose heart is to bring glory to Himself and do that by redeeming the world out of the clutches of of sin. As one pastor put it, he called it the scarlet thread of redemption, the thread that ties the entire Bible together, woven throughout the entire Old and New Testament, which points everything to the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, the entire Bible, every story, every character, every law, every festivity pointed all to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. We see our first parents, Adam and Eve, walking into sin, walking away from God. And as a result, the harmony and the unity, the peace that was in the garden was lost. Life as we knew it, no, it would never be the same. But there, even in Genesis chapter 3, just a few verses later, verse 15, we see what theologians call the proto-evangelium, the first gospel. It says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It's a veiled reference to Satan who would bruise the heel of Jesus on the cross, and yet through his resurrection, Jesus would deliver the final blow. 
And through Genesis, we see this ongoing theme of the effects of sin, of people walking into sin, met with the mercy of God, and the the promise renewed that this would indeed come to pass. He tells Abraham that through him, all the nations of the world would be blessed. In Genesis 22, this even takes a greater shape. More light is shed on it as God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son, his only son, But there at the last moment, God provides the lamb, the spotless sacrificial lamb, pointing to the ultimate lamb of God, Jesus, who would die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. And we see this theme continuing time and time again through the Old Testament. As God begins to narrow his plan into the people of Israel themselves. Now hear me well. I think some people have a misunderstanding of what the purpose of Israel was. Because some would say, well, God chose Israel, and so that was at the exclusion of everybody else. If you weren't part of God's people, then you were just out of luck at that time. But I would submit to you that's not the purpose of Israel at all. No, Israel was meant to be the example of how good it is to be right with God. They were to be the lighthouse, the shining city on a hill that other people would look at and say, wow, how good is it to be part of the family of God? We see that in Leviticus 19, 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 1 Kings 8. God's heart even there was for the nations to come and worship His name. And for hundreds of years, that went on and on as they long for the Messiah. Walter Kaiser says the goal of the Old Testament was to see both Jews and Gentiles coming to a saving knowledge of the Messiah who was to come. And they waited and they waited until Galatians 4 4 says, Then the fullness of time had come. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. So we see the greatest missionary who has ever been, God stepping down from the glories of heaven into our sin rotting world. He clothed himself in human flesh so that he might walk amongst our filth and redeem us out of our sin. So you see, we can talk a lot about missionaries, and we should do that, about how much they've sacrificed, how far they've gone. But church, let me remind us, no missionary has gone farther or sacrificed more than God Himself has for us. Jesus would go to the cross. He would pay the wrath of God that we deserve. He might die that we might live. So you see, though Israel rejected God as a whole, Paul says he still, God still desires for them to come to salvation because that's his desire for all people. 2 Peter 3 9 says that God is not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Skip down to verse 11. Scripture says everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. For who? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So you see, a lot of times we talk about missions, plural, but what you really see in the Bible is that there is mission singular. There is one unified mission, the missio Dei, the mission of God, one mission to redeem mankind. We just happen to be a part of that mission. God allows us to be a part of his mission. So what you see, I believe abundantly clear is that God's heart is to redeem the world. My question is, do we have that same heart? If our desire is not for people of all walks of life, all nationalities, all ethnicities, all skin colors, all even sin struggles to come to salvation, then my question is, do we actually have the same heart as God? You see, we can come to church and we can talk about how much we love Jesus But if we don't love what He loved, then we have to question how much we truly love Him to begin with. Charles Spurgeon says it this way. It's very hard language, but I believe it's true language. He says, have you no wish for others to be saved? He says, then you are not saved yourself. 
be sure of that. God desires all peoples to come and worship Him. The question is, is how does that happen? Well, that's the second thing we see on the screen. You'll see it on the screen. We see it in the passage. The message of God. Now remember, Paul is talking about Israel as he is writing. But look at verse 2. He says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Paul says what was keeping Israel from salvation. There's two parts to it. He says, number one, they were passionate, but they were passionate without the truth. Now their devotion, their zeal, it was unmatched. Yet Paul reminds us that you can be very sincere about something and yet still be sincerely wrong about something. Just because I believe something genuinely, authentically, with great passion does not make it true. Today, I could get on an airplane and believe passionately with all my heart that I can jump out of that airplane without a parachute and just flap my arms really, really hard. I'm going to fly. It's not going to happen. You see, just because I'm passionate about something doesn't make it true. And you look around our world today, and there are a lot of people passionate about a lot of things. They will yell loud about it. They'll talk a lot about it. They'll post it on social media. Yet what you see is they are blown to and fro by the emotion of popular opinion in our time. And it doesn't matter whether it's about religion or politics or social issues. They will be very passionate about it. And yet, Scripture says they will still spend an eternity in hell. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now, some would say, Pastor, you're too narrow-minded. You need to open your mind a little bit more. Why put God in a box? My answer simply is, I'm not putting God in this box. He's putting Himself in this box. God has said, this is how you know me. This is how you have salvation. And therefore, if God himself has said that, who am I to look back at him and say, God, no, you're wrong. There's more than that. You see, passion is a good thing. Emotion is a good thing. But the question is, shouldn't we be passionate about the truth? Because you see, they were passionate. But the second thing Paul says is they were passionate about trying to save themselves. They were passionate about their own works. They read the law of Moses and they were passionate about it, but they misunderstood the intent of the law of Moses to begin with. They see in verse 5 that Moses says, if you keep the commandments, you will live. And so they tried to do that and tried to keep it perfectly, but they didn't realize that that was an impossible task. So you see, they devoted themselves to being more religious, to trying to be better, work harder, yet no good works would ever ever fill the chasm that separated them and God. That's why in verse 3, they did not receive the righteousness of God. And in the same way, throughout our world today, there are countless people trying to save themselves. Whether they do that in the name of religion Charity, good works, they are trying to do these things to appease their conscience and somehow make them right with God. Paul says they were trying to save themselves by keeping of the law, but they missed the purpose of the law entirely. Because you see, the law cannot save us. And by the way, it was never meant to in the first place. No, the law was meant to show us how far we fall short and as a result, point us to the one who could save us alone. That's why in verse 4, look at the good news. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, this isn't referring to Christ removing the moral expectations of the law. It is Jesus removing this futile thinking that you can save yourself. He puts an end to that. Because some today, maybe you in this room, you're trying to be so good. You're trying to be better and you're wondering, how good do I have to be? Or you're even wondering, maybe did that thing I did this weekend or what I saw or what I did, God, is that enough? Have you forgiven me for what I've done or does that put me too far outside of your grace? And so there's this question, have I done enough? Jesus here says, enough of that. 
put that to the end. No, you are not saved based on what you have done. You are saved based on what Christ has done for you. And that's why I notice in verse 6 and 7, I won't read it, but Paul has this interesting way of basically answering the question, how do we find salvation? How do we find faith? He says for you to have salvation, to know God, you don't have to go to heaven. You don't have to go to the depths of this earth. You don't have to go on this transcendent, far spiritual journey. No, you don't have to go all through these things. Why? Because He's right here. You don't have to go searching for God because He's right here. Verse 8 says, salvation does not come from your ability to find God. Your salvation comes from faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That He is the Son of God who went to the cross to die the death that you deserve that you might live in His name. Notice verse 9. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now, my concern as I read this passage is that how most modern Americans interpret this passage is very, very different than what Paul meant in this passage. In American Christianity, we have taken, confessed Jesus as Savior and Lord, and we have turned it into, well, if you would just open your mouth and repeat this prayer, then you will be saved. Church, friends, I find that nowhere in the Word of God. Then even still, some have taken confession of Jesus to mean that if someone gives their life to Christ, they need to walk down the aisle and confess that to the church. They need to have a public confession of their salvation. But yet again, I find that nowhere in Scripture. In fact, I would counsel someone not to do that very thing. You say, well, pastor, why not? It is because that would then be adding a work onto the expectation of their salvation. No, what I see in the New Testament is the public proclamation that you are now a Christian, you are part of the body of Christ, is never walking down an aisle, it's baptism. That is the public sign that you are part of the body of Christ. So, what you see is that in American Christianity, to confess Jesus as Lord, it risks nothing. It risks nothing. You see, you can come to church, you can say Jesus is Lord, you can repeat the words on the screen, and yet it costs you absolutely nothing. In Paul's day, it could cost you everything. In fact, think about it like this in a modern example. Imagine today you leave this place, you get in your car and you drive home, and you're just about to go to your afternoon Sunday nap when you hear a knock on the door. You go somewhat surprised to see who it is and you open the door to find government officials with armed guards standing behind them. And they say, sir, ma'am, we just followed you home from First Baptist Surfside. And you know that being a part of a church is illegal in our land today. You being a Christian is a threat to the state. So we're going to give you one opportunity right here to renounce Jesus as Lord. And then we might let you go. You think for a moment, you pray for a moment, you collect your nerve, you step forward and you say, no, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my Savior. And at that moment, you are put into handcuffs, you are put into the car, you are tried and you are executed for your faith. That was what was on the line in Paul's time. And that's what is on the line for many of our brothers and sisters, even as we speak around the world. You see, to confess Jesus as Lord means that I have surrendered everything everything that I am to Jesus. That's what it means to confess Him as my Lord. So you see, what Paul has shown us is the good news. He's shown us that the good news is that while we are lost in darkness, Jesus has pursued us. He has died for us and offers us new and abundant life if today we would surrender and put our faith and trust in Him. But the final question that we ask is this, whose responsibility is that then? to take that gospel to the world. That's what we see here in verses 14 and 15, lastly, is the method of God. Consider verse 14. He says, How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those 
who preached the good news. Now, you know the scene in Matthew 28. Jesus is there after his resurrection. He has gathered the disciples together. And I imagine some of the disciples thought, here we go. Jesus has defeated death. He is going to establish his kingdom on this earth, and he's going to do it right now. They were ready. But Jesus then looks at them. And instead, he says, no, you go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. And at that moment, he ascends into heaven, leaving this task of spreading the good news to normal, average, insignificant people. I will never assume to know the wisdom of God as to why he chose us to be his hands and his feet. Jesus knew and in fact promised it would be difficult. He knew that by sharing the gospel, there would be friendships that would be ended, families that would be abandoned, freedoms that were lost, and even lives forfeit for the sake of the gospel. Yet notice, what does he say about those who take the gospel? He quotes Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now, we love it when people come and share good news with us. We love it when that doctor has a good report or maybe that teacher said we passed the exam. I remember when I was here three and a half years ago for my trial weekend. And I remember I preached, y'all were voting on me to call me as pastor. And I went into the fellowship hall and somewhat nervous there waiting on the results. Are they going to call me to be the pastor or are they not? When all of a sudden through the doors come Roger Reese and Ricky Hustis and they are smiling that I had been called to be the pastor of this church. And I remember we hugged one another. I was shedding tears at that moment. I was so grateful for those that brought me good news. Now, as I think about it, though, Roger and Ricky have not hugged me since then. (laughs) Don't know what to take of that, but it was good to have the good news. How much sweeter are those who bring the gospel You see, this isn't just talking about a preacher. This is talking about you. Now notice three quick things as we wrap this up today about what does it look like to take the gospel. Number one, there is a speaking requirement. Salvation comes from belief. But the question is, is how can someone believe if they have not heard? Because you see, many have this idea, many Christians have this idea that I don't need to speak the gospel. I just kind of need to live the gospel. There's a popular saying in churches today, it goes like this, preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. But friends, let me share with you, that simply is not a biblical statement. Nobody is going to be saved just by your good works. Nobody is going to be saved just because you were kind to them. Now hear me well, we should love, we should serve, we should be kind. Why? So that we might open doors to then verbally share the gospel with them. Because Paul is clear, Romans 1.16, I am unashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. That's why in our mission statement, you'll see it on the screen in just a moment. I think it's already up there. Engage the nations with the, with the gospel. What does that look like? In our mission statement, if you grab it on the way out, there's three statements under that. Let me read them to you. We are ambassadors of Christ who are unashamed of the gospel, who seek to share the love of Christ everywhere we go. You'll go to the next slide. We understand how to effectively communicate and defend the gospel to a world and culture without Christ. And then lastly, on the next slide, you'll see we serve through our local church, reaching the Grand Strand and engaging in world missions. Our goal is to attract others to Christ through our love and service as we verbally share the gospel. You see, our goal is to learn how to share the gospel so that we might effectively engage our culture for Jesus. We might engage that coworker, that student there in the classroom, that person in our family with the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I've always loved the testimony. You can read it in her book. It's by the name of Rosaria Butterfield. Rosaria Butterfield, at one point, she was a very liberal college professor And she was a practicing lesbian living with her partner. And she said at that time, she was happy. She was loving life. She thought she was a very moral person. And what I find fascinating, and I think a lot of Christians should read her testimony, because she said she encountered a lot of Christians, but not one of them actually shared the gospel with them or with her. She said a lot of them, they 
told her how wrong she was or that she was going to go to hell, but not one talked about the cross or the love of Christ until there was a pastor by the name of Ken. Ken lived the gospel, but also verbally shared the gospel with Rosaria. He and his wife invited her over to dinner one night, and what surprised her was that he didn't just start with how wrong she was. No, he loved her. They invited her to dinner. She said it was clear they wanted to actually be friends with me because they cared for me about a person, as a person, which then later opened the door for him to share the gospel with her. And she says, looking back, I realized that being a lesbian was not my biggest sin. Unbelief was my biggest sin. The biggest need of her life was to give her life to Jesus. And through this example by this pastor and his wife and them actually verbally sharing Jesus with her, her life was radically transformed in the process. So we have to speak. But secondly, we are called to speak. That means we have to actually go to people to speak to them. You see, the beauty of the church is that each and every one of us, we are called to go, but we are not all called to go to the same place. We need missionaries, yes, but we also need godly teachers, godly accountants, godly business owners, godly waitresses who will go out boldly into their unique mission fields and live for Jesus because they're going to encounter people this week that Nathan Sweet never will. They're going to encounter people that will listen to you that will never listen to me just because I am a pastor. So you see, we are all called to the mission field, but for many of you, your mission field is not across the Atlantic. Maybe it's across the room. Maybe it's across the room in your place of work. Maybe it's across the room in your classroom. Maybe it's across your living room to a family member who needs to hear about Jesus. You see, our goal as a church is to help equip you as to who to do that, how to do that, and also to create opportunities for us to share the love of Christ. You might say, well, pastor, this sounds great, but how can I be involved? I want to share the love of Christ. I want to tell others about Jesus, but I just don't know where to start. Well, if that's you, I've got good news for you. Come back tonight at 5.30, equipped to engage as we are going through these weeks of learning how to share the gospel and what does that look like and then put that in to practice. Maybe consider being a part of our New York trip in December, just simply saying, I don't know what God is calling me to, but I'm just going to go and be faithful to this calling. Because you see, I'm reminded we are called to go, but the third and last thing I see here is we're not called to go alone. We're called to go with other brothers and sisters. And lastly, I am reminded that we do not go alone because God Himself goes with us. Jesus says in the Great Commission, I am with you even to the ends of the age. The God who is sovereign over the storm that just passed through here, the wind and the waves and all of its power, that is the same God who goes with you to share the gospel with your coworker, to share the gospel with your friend. You see, as we go, we need to be reminded what our responsibility is and what it isn't. You see, I'm reminded our responsibility is not to save anyone because I can't save anybody. I can't change anyone's heart. No, God is sovereign over that. God is the one that draws people. He is the one that transforms lives. I am simply called to go and testify about what God has done in my life. And at the end of the day, when we ask, have we been successful? What does it mean to be successful as a church and also as individuals? The, the answer is not how many people have given their lives to Christ. It's not how many people are sitting in the pews this morning. The, question, the answer to the question is, in one word, have I been faithful? Have I been faithful to do what God has called me to do? Knowing that if God has called us and we step out on faith, even if we feel completely inadequate, if He has called us, He will equip us and He will go with us. So church, how beautiful are the feet of those who are faithful? How beautiful are the feet of those who go to Haiti, who go to New York? But also how beautiful are the feet of those who go into the nursery? and hold a baby on a Sunday morning, or go into the youth and teach a youth small group. How beautiful are the feet of someone who goes across the room and gives a hug to someone in a small group that is hurting today. How beautiful are the feet of those who are faithful. And church, as I close this today, I simply want to say thank you. Because as I see this church, I truly believe we have many 
who were faithful. Many who were faithful servants who have beautiful hands and feet of Christ. Thank you. And my challenge and my prayer through this is that their number would only increase. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that we would be motivated to go and to live for you and to share the good news of the gospel. Why? Because you first loved us. You pursued us. So we go because you came for us. And so God, today, I pray for us that we would be motivated, we would be spurred on to be your hands and feet. And Lord, I pray perhaps for this person in the room today that has heard this sermon and they've heard about the gospel and the love that God has for us. And Lord, that's a foreign idea for them. Lord, they struggle with how to love others because they've never truly experienced your love. Today, I pray that this would be the day of their salvation. That today they would recognize their need for you and would surrender to you as their Lord and Savior today. But God, we love you. And we pray that you would find us faithful in this place. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing what we call our song of response. Simply a time for you to pray and ask God, how do you want me to respond to the teaching of your word? Whether that needs to be something you pray at the front as you leave here today, maybe it's something you need to do then. Maybe you want to come and pray with Adam or myself. But whatever the case is, let me challenge you not to leave here today without walking in obedience. Would you stand and would you sing?
Amen. If you would be seated just for a quick moment, lunch can wait a few more minutes because I've got some great news I want to share with you. Kerry, if you want to just come and stand. Everybody, um, he probably doesn't need a lot of introduction, but this is Kerry Rowell. Um, Wanda there is in the back. Um, we love these guys so much. And uh, Miss Dot, you talking about answered prayer. This is an example of answered prayer today. Um, everybody um, that you know, uh, Kerry, he has gone for, I guess, almost probably two years now. Um, a year and a half battling through cancer and God has brought him through and he is back he and Wanda and said you just got a really good scan and God is blessed tremendously so Kerry we're just thankful to have you back he basically wanted to come today and just express his gratitude to you as a church for your prayers and your love and your support and so Wanda Kerry we love you so much and it's so great to see you here again let's give God praise for them Amen. Come up and love on Carrie and Wanda. Thank you guys so much. God is a good God. But church, we've gathered. Let's go and be the church.